Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. So far in EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we've spent a lot of time talking about signals, but we haven't spent a lot of time talking about processing signals. We'll start fixing that today by introducing finite impulse response filters. As you might imagine, there's also infinite impulse response filters, but analyzing those requires a lot more mathematical machinery than we have right now, so we'll start here. The big picture is that you have a real-world continuous time signal, X of T. We run that through an analog-to-digital conversion process to create the discrete time signal X of N. We process X of N to create an output signal Y of N that we then run through a digital-to-analog converter to create a continuous time signal in the real world. Now, from the point of view of the user, all they care about is the input and the output in the continuous time domain. The fact that you've implemented this with a discrete time system internally is of no concern to them. Later in the course, we'll consider analyzing the full chain. So far, essentially, we've looked at this. We've studied the analog to digital and the digital to analog conversion processes and looked at the conditions under which yt is equal to xt, assuming you don't do anything else here in the middle. In that context, we talked about things like the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. In this upcoming series of lectures, we're going to focus on the stuff in the middle. Now, the stuff in the middle could be a fairly generic computer program that could do all kinds of things. We're going to specifically focus on programs that implement a class of systems called linear time invariant systems. We can analyze such systems in the time domain or the frequency domain. The next couple of lectures will focus on the time domain, and then we'll switch to talking about the frequency domain. There's a correspondence between the domains, so you can choose whichever domain best answers whatever particular question you're asking. In addition to having the tools to analyze an existing system, these tools will let us synthesize a system that might match a set of requirements. Now, I use the term computer program, but this doesn't necessarily have to be implemented using a program implemented on some kind of microprocessor. It may be some circuit built out of raw multipliers and adders and other such logic chips, or maybe implemented on an FPGA or some custom ASIC. As an example of a simple system, you might just take all the inputs and square them. Now, this is a nonlinear system, so most of the techniques we talk about in this course don't apply to this system. I'll define what it means for a system to be linear a couple of lectures from now. Another example of a system might be something where you take the average of a certain number of consecutive values. We often represent discrete time signals graphically using one of these stem plots. This kind of plot reminds us that there's nothing missing between the various values of n. There's nothing between 1 and 2. It's 4 at 1, it's 2 at 6, and there's no n equals 1.5 in between. Let's look at a system where we're going to add three consecutive inputs and divide by 3. In this particular case, the system is looking into the future. In order to figure out the output y of n, I need the input x of n, but also x of n plus 1 and x of n plus 2. So this wouldn't work for a real-time system. This might be an algorithm you run on a set of data that you've collected and stored on a hard drive. To visualize what's going on, we can make a table like this. To figure out the output y for y equals 0, we look at x0, x1, and x2. That gives us 2 plus 4 plus 6. That gives us 12. And dividing 12 by 3 gives us 4. We can march along, and to figure out what y of 1 is, we look at x1, x2, and x3. We add those up. 4 plus 6 plus 4, that gives us 14. Divide by 3, I've got 14 over 3. And we can keep going. Eventually, we only have zeros going in, so we have zeros coming out. And over on this side, we have only zeros going in, so we only have zeros coming out. But here, for n equals negative 2, there we start getting some non-zero input. So here I would have 0 plus 0 plus 2. That's the first input we get that's not 0. Average all of that, I wind up with 2 thirds. So here we have a plot of the input and the output. Notice that because to figure out the output, 
we need future values of the input, the output actually starts before the input. This is an example of what we call a non-causal system. We say a system is causal if it doesn't depend on the future. It can only depend on the present and the past. Now, it doesn't have to depend on the present and the past. You could make a nihilistic system that was just yn equals zero. This is certainly causal because it doesn't depend on future values. But incidentally, it doesn't depend on the present or the past either. It's also not a very useful system. If a system depends at most on the present, again, this could include yn equals zero, and doesn't depend on the past or the future, we say it is memoryless. So let's look at another three-point averager. This time, we're only going to use past values. So this system is causal. So we can implement this in real time. And to be specific, I should say we're not just using past values. We're also using the present. The input starts at n equals 0, so the output doesn't start until n equals 0. At n equals 0, when we look at the previous two values, we're not adding anything. So when I average these three values, we wind up with two-thirds. We can then march along and say, look at y4. Here, we're averaging 6, 4, and 2. That's 12 divided by 3, which gives me 4. And we can keep going. Eventually, we don't have any non-zero input. And after that point, we only get zeros out. Now, later in the course, when we look at infinite impulse response filters, it's a different story. But we'll save that for later. Imagine you have some time series data where you're looking for a really subtle trend line as indicated by this 1.02 to the n term here. Now, imagine that this has been subject to some kind of interference that's oscillatory in nature with this frequency. You might say, oh, let's run an averaging filter on it to try to average out these little variations so we can better see this trend line. If you try to use a three-point averager, that doesn't work very well. And that kind of makes sense. If you look at the period of the wave, three samples of averaging isn't long enough to really capture having one of the positive going parts of the wave cancel with a negative going part. So you don't wind up with much difference. One thing to note, there is a ramp up period where your averager is kind of filling up. And there's also a ramp off period once you run out of data. Now, if you try a seven point averager, that does a lot better job at matching the period of the wave. So you can imagine positive going parts of the wave canceling with the negative parts of the wave in the averager. And this isn't perfect. A little bit of that sinusoidal variation gets through, but the trend line's a lot more obvious. Another thing to note is that this longer averager has this longer transient period at the beginning where things are ramping up and a longer period at the end where things are ramping back down. You can imagine the averager marching along, and you see that it basically runs out of data at the end. Since it's a longer averager, we wind up with longer total output. The way systems like this affect sinusoids is the topic of frequency domain analysis. We'll spend a lot of time in this course talking about that. Now let's generalize our idea of this averager that looks into the past, but also includes the present to allow these generalized weights B sub K. B0 would correspond to the weight of the present sample, B1 one step in the past, B2 two steps in the past, and so on, up to M steps in the past. We could write B in terms of a vector of coefficients, where by convention the first coefficient listed here is B0. And stepping through all the indices for this particular example, we could write this as 3xn, minus x in minus 1, plus 2x in minus 2, plus x in minus 3. Now, one of these coefficients in the middle here could be 0, indicating that a particular term is missing from the summation. We say a filter that looks up to m time steps into the past is an m order filter, and it has length m plus 1 because you need that coefficient for the present. If you have a simple memoryless filter, something like yn equals 3xn, that would be considered a zeroth order filter. It's not very interesting. It's just multiplying all the values by 3. It's like you just turned up the volume. We refer to systems of this form as finite impulse response filters. 
In the next lecture, we'll talk about exactly what an impulse response is. Because of its finite nature, when we run out of data, eventually the output will go to zero. Similarly, there will be this issue at the beginning where the filter is basically filling up with data. Here's an example of filtering stock data. The input is shown in black and the output is shown in purple. And this is the result of a 50-point averager. And by the particular font used here, you can tell this is a pretty old slide. These FIR filters are examples of linear systems. In a couple of lectures, we'll talk precisely about what it means for a system to be linear. The main thing to know right now is that if we have a linear system, we can precisely characterize it by the way it responds to sinusoids and the way it responds to impulses. We'll talk about impulses in the next lecture.